The war on Afghanistan has killed over... The U.S. has been at war with Afghanistan since I was 15 years old. 17 years and three presidents later, that war is still raging on with no end in sight, making it the longest running war in U.S. history. It also means that people who were the age I was when it started will soon be old enough to fight in a war that's existed longer than they have. But at least for them, the consequences are far removed. For Afghan children, it means growing up their entire lives surrounded by chaos, trauma, and bloodshed. The war on Afghanistan has killed over 100,000 people at least. That's just an estimate. The toll could be much higher. Human trafficking in the country is on the rise. Civilians are regularly killed in Taliban and coalition attacks. A booming heroin trade led by warlords, some of them propped up by the U.S., has led to an addiction epidemic and because of sharing needles, an HIV epidemic. All this and more has made Afghanistan the world's second largest producer of refugees. And of course, U.S. soldiers continue to die. And for what? What was this war even about in the first place? What's it about now? Well, if you ask the people who started it, we're there to kill terrorists and protect freedom or something. But the Taliban is stronger than ever, so why the hell are we still there? Let's rewind. The war in Afghanistan was launched on October 7th, 2001, in response to 9-11. Never mind that none of the 19 hijackers were Afghan nationals. In fact, 15 were from America's greatest Arab ally, Saudi Arabia. And they planned and trained for the attack, not in Afghanistan, but in Arizona, Florida, California, and Hamburg, Germany. However, President George W. Bush declared a war on terror that targeted Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, and he accused the Taliban of providing them with shelter and assistance. The Taliban offered to hand bin Laden over if the U.S. provided evidence against him, but Bush wasn't interested. Whipped up into a vengeful fervor, few if any voices in the U.S. opposed this war on terror. The only person to vote against it was Congressional Representative Barbara Lee. Three days after September 11th, she cast the lone vote against invading Afghanistan. September 11th changed the world. Our deepest fears now haunt us. Yet I am convinced that military action will not prevent further acts of international terrorism against the United States. Nonetheless, the U.S. took revenge for 9-11 by doing what it does best, bombing the shit out of a poor brown country. The United States military has begun strikes against al-Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. NATO, searching for a new reason for its existence after the fall of the Soviet Union, happily joined with the U.S. to expel the Taliban and install a friendlier government. These carefully targeted actions are designed to disrupt the use of Afghanistan as a terrorist base of operations and to attack the military capability of the Taliban regime. The Taliban and al-Qaeda were quickly driven out of the country. But that didn't last long. The U.S. replaced the Taliban with a corrupt central government, local warlords, and a brutal military occupation that eventually led to the resurgence of Taliban rule across much of the country, which was also helped by support from Pakistan. Al-Qaeda, meanwhile, may have been chased out of Afghanistan, but has since found safe havens in other weak countries. In fact, today Al-Qaeda may be stronger than ever, thanks to America's military interventions and regime change wars in the Middle East, which encouraged the extremist group's growth in Iraq, Libya, Syria, Yemen, and Somalia. In fact, it was U.S. intervention in Afghanistan that led to the creation of Al-Qaeda in the first place. 2001 isn't the first time the U.S. meddled in Afghan affairs. It started in the 1960s as part of the Cold War, when the U.S. and the Soviets were competing to show the Afghan people who was more generous. But then the decision was made to suck the Soviets into Afghanistan by making it their Vietnam. So in 1979, under Zbigniew Brzezinski, then National Security Advisor to Jimmy Carter, the U.S. began secretly arming and funding a collection of Islamist fighters known as the Mujahideen to fight Afghanistan's Soviet-backed government in what was called Operation Cyclone. After the Soviets withdrew, the Mujahideen took over the country, but they behaved as warlords. Then the Taliban, who were originally Afghan refugees in neighboring Pakistan, where they received a hardline religious education in Saudi-financed schools, invaded Afghanistan, and with the help of the Pakistani government, toppled the Mujahideen. Asked in 1998 if he regretted supporting Islamic fundamentalists, Brzezinski replied, 
What is most important to the history of the world? The Taliban or the collapse of the Soviet Empire? Some stirred up Muslims or the liberation of Central Europe and the end of the Cold War? By then, some of the people who fought alongside the Mujahideen, known as the Afghan Arabs, moved on to form Al-Qaeda, terrorizing people in whatever country they took haven in, with their eyes set on the US. Then in 2001, U.S. policy all those years ago blew back with 9-11. Suddenly, Afghanistan was to be the target of American revenge. Of course, you don't hear about this recent history in the news. And the war in Afghanistan today is practically invisible. So invisible, it's easy to forget the U.S. is even conducting a war there. That's mostly because after invading Afghanistan, the U.S. and global attention quickly pivoted to the war on Iraq, which had no connection whatsoever to 9-11. Afghanistan became a forgotten war that only got attention when a massive crime took place, like this or that massacre. The international medical aid group Doctors Without Borders accused U.S. forces of deliberately bombing that hospital in Kunduz City. 22 people were killed. United Nations Human Rights Chief called the attacks inexcusable and possibly even criminal. And of course, there's zero accountability for U.S. crimes in Afghanistan. Afghans have submitted over a million war crime claims to the International Criminal Court. The U.S. has responded by threatening sanctions against ICC judges if they proceed with any investigation into alleged war crimes committed by Americans in Afghanistan. We will not cooperate with the ICC. We will provide no assistance to the ICC and we certainly will not join the ICC. We will let the ICC die on its own. Then there's the money. The authorization for use of military force approved after 9-11 that made war on Afghanistan possible has been used to justify war anywhere and everywhere ever since, costing lots and lots of money. The U.S. has spent anywhere from 1.5 to 5.6 trillion dollars on the war on terror since 9-11. The war in Afghanistan alone costs about $45 billion a year. From 2010 to 2012, when there were 100,000 U.S. soldiers stationed there, it was even higher, more than $100 billion a year. All that money and death for a war that doesn't seem to have a purpose. The reason keeps shifting. American politicians argue that Afghanistan was once a safe haven for Al-Qaeda, and if the U.S. leaves, it will become one again. But the world is different now. There are other safe havens for Al-Qaeda, and in some countries, like Yemen and Syria, the U.S. and its allies are fighting on the same side as Al-Qaeda. This war just doesn't make any sense. Even the mainstream media has caught on. There is clearly something about this war that is intractable, despite who the president is. And every once in a while, we even get real talk from the generals. I'm not convinced we're winning it in Afghanistan. That's because we're losing. Even the New York Times concedes that today, the Taliban is gaining momentum, seizing territory, and killing Afghan security forces in record numbers. The reality is, the U.S. doesn't want to admit defeat. It's a war that can't be won. But the arrogance and hubris of American policymakers prevent them from recognizing the obvious. They still wrongly believe that they can win, but they can't define what that means. And so the war grinds on, killing more Afghans, destroying another generation, all for nothing.